Hello and welcome to the Chris Roll Podcast on iCode Media. Today I had a great conversation with Dr. Mick, Drs. Mick Kling, Aaron Warner, Lori Sorensen, and Ron John from Cooper. And we talked about uh, inflation. We talked about profitability with specific types of contact lenses. We talked about organizational structures and core values and keeping our teams excited about what they're doing. I think it was a really great conversation. Uh, please enjoy our conversation. And as always, be sure to subscribe to the podcast, write a review, share it with your friends, and support those who support us. I want to talk about the My Day Multifocal for a second. We had the opportunity to do a preclinical trial with this lens this last summer. And there were a couple of things that I thought were really helpful. The first one is that it is different than a lot of the multifocals that we've used before in our practices where patients, especially early emerging presbyopes, really managed the, it didn't cause a lot of additional uh, distance blur for them. And the other thing that was really helpful was, because we've never been involved in a clinical trial before, was to understand uh, the sort of questions that we might ask our patients. And we ask a pa- our patients a lot of questions about their patient, about their satisfaction with a contact lens, but what we weren't doing was actually having them score that themselves. So one of the parts of this that was really interesting to me was asking patients on a scale of one to 10, how they would score their vision, how they would score their comfort in their current lenses, and then how they would do the same on their uh, new lenses. And it showed me a lot of times where patients would say they were happy, might rate their vision as a six or a seven. And um, and then it also reframed their thinking about their current satisfaction in their lenses and allowed me to open up the door to offering other solutions. So if you haven't tried something like that in your clinical practice, I would encourage you to. And I would also encourage you to try the MyDay Multifocal for your patients. I'm really excited today to talk about our new sponsor, Matthew Health. We've been using Matthew Health in my practice for the last few years, and there's been a couple things that I really like about it. The first is that when patients go to the store and they're looking for an AREDS 2 supplement, they are bombarded with a lot of different options. What I like about Matthew Health is that it keeps the zinc content at what the AREDS 2 supplement did, so 25 milligrams, and it also adds the benefit of mesozeaxanthine. Additionally, I like MacuHealth because they're always trying to reformulate things so that you can improve absorption with patients. You can also count on them to continue to push the envelope, not just with AREDS type supplements and macular health type supplements, but also visual performance supplements. But now they have an omega-3, and I'm excited to see what they do in the future. So it's been great for my practice, great for my patients. Check out Mackie Health if you haven't done so yet. Uh, one of the things that I thought was really important to kind of have a conversation about was the idea of inflation and why inflation is important to our practices and also why having a strategic plan in relation to how we purchase things, how we be aware of inflation and be an intentional as a practice owner about how we're going to manage inflation Uh, so that our practices can maintain the same success as they have, continue to grow, and and primarily the reason is so that we can continue to serve patients. And so I think one of the things that um, I wanted Mick, you and Lori on to talk about was, what are you doing from from a vision source standpoint? You all have been really kind of the forefront of looking at the business of optometry. So Mick, tell me about your perspective on inflation and how it impacts our practice and the research you've done. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about this because it is such an important uh, topic. In fact, I'll tell you that when all of this started to happen, it really forced us, even within my own practice, to take a minute to step back and say, well, what are we doing within our own practice? Because um, when it comes to the way we price things, uh, both professional services and the products we sell, we really don't have or haven't historically had a very good strategy about how we did that. Uh, our typical strategy, if there is any, would every few years uh, we would look around the room and say, have we raised our fees in a while? And everybody would say no. And we would then say, OK, well, let's move that up a dollar and move that up five dollars and move that three. So it wasn't very well thought out. And so when all of the um, news started to come out about inflation, it really caused us um, to think about how can we educate the membership about what to do in this situation because I suspect many practices are, are like mine and that you get busy with patient care and the days go by and the years go by and you you, you don't make any adjustments. And so at, at the prompting of Aaron um, asking Lori and I to put together some education 
around how do we communicate that message to our members. Um, we did some research and, and put together uh, some data that I think is, is eye-opening and then just provided some strategies for for our membership on on how to how to address um, inflation's inflationary impact within the practice. Mick, I'm going to have a follow-up question on that. When you think about like a, a, a general practice that's generating, let's say, a million dollars a year, um, what is the impact to inflation of inflation to that owner based on increased general cost of goods, increased general human capital? Uh, have you done the math on that? Uh, yeah, in fact, we have looked at that because as a as a great illustration, you know, you can show um, a doctor the impact of inflation just by simply taking a model of a, a typical practice, let's say a million dollar revenue generating practice, applying the typical metrics of cost of goods, people cost, place cost, things cost, and you can predict what the the, the bottom line should look like. If you then apply just even incremental um, increases in cost of goods. So if you remember, we have we have two main things that generate revenue in the practice. We have professional fees and we have things that we sell products. So all of the things that we sell, the frames, lenses, and contact lenses, if you apply just even a modest increase in cost to, to that bucket of expenses, um, the second big bucket are our wages, our people costs. And as we all know, the cost of human capital has gone up a lot. Um, so if you apply even a modest increase there and then, you know, pencils and papers and paper clips and those sort of things go up just because the, the tide is rising. And if you just apply incremental three to five percent increases in each of those buckets of expenses, then the bottom line can be impacted easily three to five percent. So in a million dollar revenue generating practice, that's thirty to fifty thousand dollars a year and lost profitability just with these small little incremental increases of your of your expenses. So it's um, $50,000 to a lot of us is a lot of money. And and with the average practice size and vision source being about a million dollars, a little smaller that on the national level, um, that really does start to take a bite out of um, the, the cash flow of the practice and even our personal income. Lori, what do you do with you know, I would imagine that these inflationary costs have a toll on our staff, and maybe they're aware of it or not aware of it, but you're really good about kind of understanding and identifying our teams and how to be more efficient with our teams and bring our teams together, figure out where they're best suited. Do you get the sense that some of the things that Mick is talking about does have an impact on just sort of their outlook on, on the practice and, and what they're doing, or, and how do you combat that? So I think that there's like two different things there. One is how inflation is affecting their. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I started going down one path for an answer, and then you said something else. I went down another path with the an answer. Um, but one is that, you know, it, this is affecting our staff too, right? I mean, their costs are going up, and I can feel it. I can tell that my staff is more stressed about money than they've ever been. We are complaining that we're having to pay them more than we ever have. You know, I see some crazy stuff that's happening out there that, that people or staff is demanding so that they stay. Um, when it gets that crazy, sometimes it's not worth it, obviously. But, um, and um, I think that for in a practice like our, like mo a lot of practices do, they're, they kind of have an openness about a significant part of their finances, right? And so I think letting staff know that um, and talking about that, we, we did raise our fees. We were a little bit ahead of some people because I have this financial guy who analyzed the practice over this last year and said, if you don't raise every single price you have 6%, you're gonna make less money. And I went, what the heck? Um, and that's a, that's, a, that's a big, tall order to raise everything you do 6%, especially since we have vision plans and there's some things we don't have control over and everything. So I had to sit down and figure out how to do that. And I, I didn't want to spend a lot of time doing it. So I came up with some strategies to how to do it quickly and, and more efficiently. Yeah, I think the, you know, the thing that I, I really was eye-opening to me, Mick, and I shared some of this with you all back in December, you and Aaron, but um, you know, when I looked at what you know, what I was happy accepting, I mean, I'm begrudgingly happy accepting from a managed vision care plan in 2008 when I graduated in order, if, if that number, it wasn't, but if that number was a hundred dollars per examination in today's dollars, real dollars, it would have, if you look at the inflation from that time period, it would have been like, it has to be like $121 per examination. And guess what? 
I'm not making $121 uh, per examination. Point is, is that it should have increased by 20 per, 21% over that mm-hmm. time period. And so, you know, it puts us in this in this place where we can increase some things, right, to cover these costs. We can increase, you know, certain costs that are out of pocket, certain um, non-covered services, certain me- really medical services to make sure that we're, we're uh, you know, one of the biggest places you've heard me talk about is, from an optometry standpoint is making sure that all of our services are at least as high, if not higher than what anybody is willing to, to compensate us for. But um, but then then you're sort of maxed out. And so the next thing that you have to do is say, okay, well, we're going to provide more services um, You know, if you're already doing all those things. So, Lori, what do you think about that or make any any thoughts on on how that impacts our practice and, and how we combat that? You know, I'll I'll just say this, Chris. If you, well, I loved what you just said it, about you know the hundred dollar example. But if you look at it from a, just the opposite direction and say, if if something that we felt was worth a dollar five years ago, what's the erosion of that value in today's dollars? And if you apply the inflationary impact over the last five years, that dollar that you 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 said this this thing, whatever it's my time or this product is worth a dollar, you actually now have the buying power of, of about 82 to 84 cents, um, depending on which um, inflation data you use. So the point is, just like you said, you'd have to generate $120 to equal the 100 that you are willing to accept. If you go spend that $100, it's not going to buy you $100 worth of yeah. things anymore. So I, I think it's a it's just a, the, the same, a slightly different way to look at the same um, problem that we're all facing within our practices, which is that in, in those dollars are important because that's what we use to pay our staff and buy the products that we that we sell. Well, I think to your point, though, Mick, the, the important part about about uh, identifying the products and identifying kind of how do we squeeze these ideas down to kind of a boil boil it down. I'm going to bring in you, Aaron, is is the idea of of one of the ways is to sort of partner with people that you align with in terms in terms of companies and really look at it as a true partnership. So um, when things are clinically equivalent and I can utilize a manufacturer for most of the things that I would want to utilize them for, maybe there's some one-offs that it's not going to work for patients that's not going to work for. But what's the why do I care about clinically equivalents and why is there, there this sort of mantra within Vision Source of when things are clinically equivalent use those vendors who partner with us as vision source doctors why is that so important well i i think it, it, that it's important for us to understand um, just as our staffs is, is putting things into perspectives uh, i love that mick did the quick math on that that million dollar practice and the potential and fifty thousand dollar loss in revenue if we do some you know quick pencil math it, to make up that revenue, we're looking at another 150 to 200 exams a year. And that's a lot of extra work. Um, I'm not interested in working harder. I'm interested in working smarter. And I, I know my staff already feels like they're running at a million miles an hour and, and they may not feel they have the ability to work any any harder. Um, and so working smarter is important. And that's really where the, the clinically equivalent uh, conversation comes in, the strategy comes in. Because if we don't have a strategy, it's no different than being in a boat in the ocean without a uh, uh, without a compass, without a, a map, and even without a, a rudder or a sail, we're kind of going wherever the, the the waves and the wind take us. Um, so that's where, especially in times like this, we sit down and say, "Hey, you know, what are we using? What products do we have? Um, what's clinically equivalent? What is still going to provide the best care to the the patient? But are we being smart about?" the products that, that we're, we're using and the partnerships that we're creating within the industry. I think one of the things that, that helps, oh, Lori, go ahead. You're going to say something. Well, I was just going to say, you know, I have seven associate doctors, so this is a conversation I have with them seven because they now? don't pay the bills. They don't, huh? Seven now. Seven yeah. now? Well, that's not really true because my son is now a partner, so okay. I'm down to, yeah, so he, if I count him, it's seven. If I don't count him, it's you could, six I would have been more impressed if you would have just said, yes, yeah, seven. <laughs> well, he's, we hire him as an associate, kind of, but he's still he's a he's, he's a partner. He's a partner in the in the business now. Um, you lost my train of thought. Um, no, I have this conversation with my associate doctors all the time because they don't they don't understand why 
why do why am I trying to get them to use certain vendors, right? And so I have to explain to them what all our vendor partners do for us, especially the elite vendors do for us as a whole and how it comes down and affects them day to day and how we can be better and how we get resources for our staff that we wouldn't have without them. And if we don't support them, we don't have those things. So there, there's a little bit, I mean, it's it's what's good for me and for the business, but there's a little bit of a loyalty thing inside of that too. Um, they, they've, it's created loyalty and I have to teach, you said, Erin, you said staff, but for me, it kind of goes first associate doctor. They got to really get that. And that's something that, you know, I meet with them every week. And, um, and we talk about that probably at least quarterly, I bet. It just anytime it comes up, I, I go and I look at the numbers and see if we're we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Ron, Ron John, when I think about um, you know one of the things that I think is really helpful because at first it can be sort of off putting. Like you mean I'm going to try to make every single patient fit in a specific type of lens or a specific manufacturer of contact lens. Um, I, I liken this to the idea of like hospitals and. Um, ambulatory surgical suites will will purchase in mass um, things that they believe are clinically equivalent based on the feedback that they get from all of their surgeons or all of their their doctors and and yet the individual doctor might have some input but not have a ton of input in those things when they're clinically equivalent so think you know let's say it's uh, sutures for example well these are decisions that be, are made all the time in large healthcare systems but what I love about vision source and the partners that we have is that I can individually make that decision what I think is best for the patients. And I can start there. I can say, look, this company, Cooper Vision, in, in your case, why I've got you on today, Ranjan, is Cooper Vision, I'm gonna partner with, I'm gonna kinda try to go all in with Cooper Vision. Maybe I even go, you know, another company because maybe Cooper Vision has one or two things I can't do, but so I'm gonna have another company. So maybe I'm gonna go all in with two companies, use a two company contact lens strategy. And there are going to be patients that aren't going to be fit in one of those two, two manufacturers lenses, probably. But the likelihood is, is that, that you make good lenses, we'll probably be able to find something. And what that allows me to do is with that true partnership, it allows me to be able to take care of the patients the way I want to take care of them without having to increase this. One of, one of the th things that allows me to do that is without having to increase the throughput um, and see, as Aaron said, to offset those costs, those additional costs, and have to see 150 more patients. I've been strategic so that I can give the care that I want to, that I believe is best for the patients. I've partnered with companies that have partnered with us so that I can make sure that I'm maximizing um, our cost of good savings. And I can actually turn a lot of that over to, uh, to patients as well. So, Ranjan, tell me, how does Cooper do? become a partner, why is it so important for Cooper to partner, and how does that help us as practitioners? So from a vision source standpoint, I mean, it's uh, it's been an amazing relationship for a long period of time, right? And, um, you know, with the history that we've had and the path that we've taken to, to bring some of the things to market that we have, provide inherent benefits for, for the EC. And we were just initially talking about inflation. Um, what, what, when, when, when we look at our stance towards any ECP, it's, it's, it's ECP first. It's, it's all about the business. So in terms of vision source, we have, uh, we are not raising any, any uh, customer brand prices at all. They're, they're locked in until the end of 2023. And they, there's already a big differential there. And that's part of, again, the vision source, Cooper Vision that we've had, when we come on board as an elite vendor, you know, we make these agreements saying, hey, you use these brands and we're going to lock you in. And it's and that's how it is right now with a number of our brands. Um, you know, when we, we can talk about profitability a little bit later, but hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. And I think, question. yeah, I think that's great, Ron John. I, I think what what is probably best is a lot of this conversation can be had in detail specifically with dollars and cents. One of the things that we can't have uh, this conversation in public on is, is some of those dollars and cents. It's one of the advantages that we have within Vision Source. And so what I encourage you all to do is if you're listening to this and you want to know more about specific dollars and cents, if you're a Vision Source member, you can go to Insight and this, uh, the rest of this conversation is going to be posted on Insight. 
um, and you can log in through there. If you're not a Vision Source member, you still have access. You'd go to Vision Source Next. You can Google Vision Source Next or follow the links in today's show notes. And we're going to have a deeper discussion on the specific details of how we manage our practices, how we partner with different companies, what that means in terms of dollars and cents. So if that interests you, you can go over to either one of those sites and we'll see you on the, on the flip side.